Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for all joining us today for um, Softree's webinar on, on resource road de design and construction using LiDAR data. Today, I, our webinar focuses on demonstrating a simplified approach to designing resource roads with LiDAR data. So the subjects that were included today, were covered today, uh, starts from importing LiDAR data, building a digital terrain model, introdu introduction to some watershed and hydrolo hydrology tools in the terrain module, basic alignment design, focus on drainage, in particular the covered editor panel, get earthwork volume estimates, and then and the creation of highly usable construction documentation to help you better communicate your design. And with that quick introduction, I will now pass it over to one of our senior engineers, David Mills. Thank you very much, Andy. And, uh, oh, we're looking at a terrain module here. We're looking at the uh, model of a LiDAR data set. Let's start from the beginning. I'm gonna start with a brand new terrain and we'll, uh, we'll import some data. Now this is LiDAR data. So I could go and open a file here, but that only allows me to open one file at a time. And I can read all kinds of different file formats, including LAS, which is what I've got. Um, also USGS, DEM, and GeoTIFF. They both work with this format here. Um, Sometimes LiDAR comes in text format, and certainly uh, you can get total station surveys in text. So if I open a LiDAR file using File Open, I can open one of them. But I want to get a little better than that. What I'd like to do is I'd like to open all these tiles, and I'd like them to fall inside my area of interest, and I want to skip the points outside. So here we go. I'm going to just open a file I've prepared called AOI. It's, it has my area of interest polygon and it's georeferenced. We've set up a coordinate system here. We're in New Brunswick and am I in the right spot? Well, here's a quick way to find out. I'm just going to use our live maps to take a look at the topography, well, the air photos, sorry. This is Google. This is Bing. And you can see the um, existing logging roads here. And if we zoom out enough, you'll, you'll be able to see that we're in the middle of New Brunswick. Okay, so that tells me that I'm at least georeferenced. Uh, I've got what I expected there. Now I'm gonna bring in the LiDAR data. So this is just a polygon. And when I use the insert function here to read my LiDAR, I can pick all my files. With all the files selected, I might get more points than I need, but um, in this case, I know that I can I can read them all in. I've done this already. Um, here is how I add an area of interest polygon. So I'm just going to select the polygon that I can see in the background, the pink polygon. Uh, it's called area of interest, and it's now a region that I can use for filtering. I can create more than one region and I can use polygons or corridors. So this is uh, the polygon that's selected. I'm reading all points, skipping zero. Outside the polygon, let's skip all points. Now this will take a little bit of time to read in. So I'm just gonna cancel here and open the, uh, the final document. It takes, I guess, about a minute to read all those points and thin them to the area of interest. So here's my, my final document. We were looking at it just a second ago. In addition to the uh, LiDAR data, I've also got that air photo image, which I got from Bing. I think I chose the Bing one because I liked it better. Now, this has actually got a lot more in it than, than uh, you might start with after first reading a file. So let's let's um, go back 
get rid of the terrain and go back to the situation where I'll, all I've got is a bunch of points. I have some road files. Now those could have come from anywhere. I put them in the background here. In fact, I traced them from my image and there they are. Those could have come from a shape file document uh, extracted from GIS. So it's easy to put a line work in the background. Uh, I've also got a feature here that I've created. I'm just going to delete that for a sec. There's my um, area of interest. Here's the roadway. It's in the background, so I can't select it. And here's all my points. Let's just zoom in a little bit because there's a lot of them. So those are our LiDAR points. And there are, in fact, um, one and a half million of them here. I did actually use a simplify operation to reduce the number of points further. Again, I'm not going to go through the process, but I used the basic grid simplification like so to reduce the number of points by um, making sure there's no more than one point per square meter. And it doesn't create a, a perfect grid as you saw by, by looking at the data points, but what it does do is remove points that are close to each other so there's only one in any given grid cell. Right, so now I want to create a, a surface and I do that using our terrain modeling tool. Um, we can build a surface with or without contours. I'm just gonna make some contours at 25 meters. In the original document we were just looking at, I had more contours. It does take a little while to create them, so let's not waste time watching contours form. And I'm just gonna generate this. And there's my surface with contours. Let's take a look at that in 3D. And so you can you can see clearly what's going on here. We've got the data in here, and there's a 3D model, and you can see it in the in the 3D window. It looks good. I don't see any issues with the with the model. I don't see any holes in it. Um, there's no stray triangles on these inside corners because I was careful to limit my triangles to being only 20 meters long. So I got a good surface. Now I have a good surface here. I, I can see my roadway, so I can actually do some planning right now as to where I'd like to put the, the new road. So here's a, a, a relatively new feature in version nine, the um, watershed calculation. So in TIN operations, that's a function in the terrain modeling ribbon, we can do this watershed calculation. You need to choose a grid size. 10 meters seems to work pretty well for this. Well, it does take um, a few seconds. And it will calculate the, the watershed boundaries and build polygons and shade them so you can, you can see where the boundaries are. Now we've, we've got a, a map coloring error right here. Uh, this really should have had a different color, so I'm just going to change it right now to cyan looks like a good color. Okay, there we go. Okay, so these are these are my watersheds, and there's a ridge running down the middle here, and of course that will be a natural watershed boundary. So if I want to build a road that has no drainage issues, down the center of the ridge is a good choice. It won't have to have any culverts to pass water from one side to the other. Now I'm going to go back to my um, original model, which was kind of ready to go. I'd already done all this stuff. And here we go. So I traced that that ridge top um, watershed boundary for part of my road, and then I said, well, I need to join to an existing road, so I think I'm going to start down here, and I think I'm going to join on to this existing road up here. 
Um, so I drew this feature. This feature is a draped feature. I can add and remove points like so. And you can see I've got a, um, a profile here. Well, this is the terrain module. It's not the road design module. Um, looks like this part at the end is pretty steep. What am I gonna do? Let's go to the location module and design a road there. So I'm gonna switch over to my location module, the road design part of Road Inch. And let's um, start a brand new design. So when you create a new design in our location module, you need to choose a, um, original ground. So that's this file, the one we were just looking at. Then you have the choice of picking an initial alignment. We don't need to do this. We could just start in the center of the train and, and draw the alignment. But I'm gonna pick the feature that I, that I drew inside of um, the terrain module. And that feature, I drew it with the mouse, but it could have been imported again from a shape file or something similar. So if, a, if an alignment feature exists somewhere, we can read it into our terrain and then use it as the initial alignment for road design. Okay, so there's the beginning of my road. I can't see the existing roads. Let's put them in the background. So again, all, all you need to make a background in terrain is another TERX file or TER. We can read our old file format too. And there it is, roads. Okay, I'm not gonna bother with the image, but I could put that in the background here too if I wanted to. And there we go. So you can see we're starting from this road here and we're finishing on this road up here. And now I'm gonna use a tool I call pegging. Uh, it's really a collection of features built into the location module, which allows you to design the horizontal alignment. Now, I, there are situations where designing the horizontal alignment is trivial and flat ground. You may just be picking a, a feature out of GIS, uh, but this is fairly steep ground. So I'm gonna use this pegging tool pegging screen layout. Um, now the screen layouts allow you to set up which windows are displayed, which options are turned on, and a few other settings. So you can see what the ground line looks like here. And there's that steep section at the end. So why don't I try to make that into a uh, switchback? So I'm going to insert a point here and move it over there. That looks like a, a wide set of contours there. Um, now that's an average of 12%, but look, it's going, it's going down right here. So why don't I move that over a little bit? Okay, now it's 15%. Um, what if I go like so? there's 13%. Okay, I'm going to continue up the ridge because this isn't too steep. And then uh, there's 11%. That looks okay. Um, this section here, you can see my cursor moving in all the windows. So yeah, that's, that's okay. Uh, it's pretty smooth along here. There's, let's change this over and finish here. So we can, you can see that I've got a, um, a pair of grades coming from that uh, wide contour bench area. Uh, these are reasonable. I'm gonna try and stand at 12%, so this is reasonable. Now I need to put in a switch back there. I'm just going to stretch this out a little bit so that I've got a flatter section. So if I do this, and this and that, I'm making the uh, alignment a little longer. So it's getting a little flatter in this zone here. Seems reasonable. 
can I put a ver can I put a horizontal curve on there for my switchback? Well, I can measure it. That is about 46 meters. Okay, I want to put in a 20 meter radius, so that'll fit. Okay, let's let's do that. I'm just going to quickly grab my horizontal curve tool, put in a default um, curve of 20 meters. This default curve was set up the same place my default cross section was set up in my default template table. So once those things are set, you don't really have to modify them until there's a, a change from your normal situation. Okay, get the default curve, apply it, do it again, and now let's just move those points together until we have one continuous curve like so. Looks good. And you can see the flattish section in the profile going around my switchback, which is good. Okay, so I've, I've created a um, horizontal alignment. I, I need to do some work around here too. It's got a very steep section there, 24.6%. And if I just, there it is there, you can see it, the cursor. Yeah, that's the steep spot right there. Um, well, you've seen enough of, of pegging. Let's jump to the next stage. So I'm gonna open a, um, the finished pegging, which is here. Now, when I create a brand new location design, by the way, this little warning is just telling me that my LiDAR data is very dense and some of my cross sections will be truncated. Not important. Uh, I'll show you in a second uh, what it means when a cross section is truncated. Um, this cross section here goes out to 500 meters on each side. Oh, but on this side, it's actually stopping before it gets to 500. That's what the warning was about. And as you can see, we've still got lots of room to fit our road in there. So I can ignore that warning. Okay. Um, so I've done the horizontal alignment here and you can see I, I came up with a solution for that steep section here by going down the hill and across this this little gully right let's do some vertical alignment before i before i start doing vertical alignment because this is going to generate volumes and it's going to i'm going to have um, all kinds of interactions between the alignment the ground and the cross section let's look at the template that we're using so this template came from my normal TPL file. And if you go to save a table or open a table, that's the default file name, normal TPL. And that's what you get when you start. So if you wanted to uh, modify the, the default settings, you modify these templates. For example, the roadway component has a width. And if I change that width, you can see that it makes the template behave differently. So that's now five meters instead of three meters. Similarly, there's a uh, surfacing thickness. I'm only using one of them. Uh, that's the slope. Surfacing two, surfacing one thickness. There it is. Um, it's this thickness here. And I can change that if I want to something else. There, now it's shorter. Similarly, the ditch has parameters that I can adjust and so on for the, similar for the slopes to what, what's the final closing slope for cut. And if I drag this up, there's the fill. And again, the slope is set to fill at 50% or one half to one, two to one, sorry. <clears throat> So that's my cross-section template. 
template, and that's going to be defining the cuts and fills and volumes. I'm happy with that. I'm not going to make any changes. I'm now ready to start doing vertical alignment. There's the ground line. I've opened this screen layout called normal, also um, the default screen layout is called normal, just like the default template table. And it's set up so that my profile windows in the front and my plan windows in the same position, I can flip back and forth by clicking these buttons down here. If I had a bigger screen, I could show them both at the same time. Or if I was using two monitors, I could size the whole window to cover two monitors and then move them side by side. So vertical alignment is as simple as clicking with the mouse. And as soon as you start doing that, it starts keeping track of your volumes. So here I'm branching from an existing road, so I probably don't want to change the start um, elevation, but I might want to change the grade there. And let's look at the data window that shows me my grades. There we are. So that first grade is 8.7%, uh, and the second grade is 5.9%. Uh, I can display that in the profile window. Not sure why it's not set up that way. So if I change the labels to display grades on the profile window, like so, pretty small font, but I can make them out. Um, that would be something I might want to update my screen layout for. So next time, those grades will be turned on when I start a new alignment. Okay, so I can I can peg through the or click through the road here and design my vertical alignment. Um, there's a gully here. I probably want to uh, keep a minimum depth because I'm going to put a culvert in there later. Now I've just made a big grade break. I'm going from 0 to 11. So let's put a vertical curve on there. Again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the vertical curve, get my default. Okay, it's set to 10. Let's see what that looks like. K equals 10 means 10 meters per 1% grade change. That looks okay. I'm going to leave that in there and continue with my grade design. Now, if I go too deep, uh, I make lots of cut. If I go too high, I make lots of fill. And the volumes are being calculated real time so you can see the effect of changing your alignment as you do it. And it doesn't take too long and to get an alignment that is more or less balanced. Uh, if you really want to be perfect about it, the solution is to use our optimizer because it will make a perfectly balanced road in uh, a minute or two. I'll demonstrate that in a minute. So here's my my uh, gentler slope. That must be in the in the uh, switchback. Just jump over to the plan window and you can see that the switchback is not visible. Uh, if, it, if I want to get to the current point, these arrows here are quite useful. They, they jump you to the next point, previous point, and they also scroll all the windows. So you can see, ah, yes, there's the, there's the middle of the, of the switchback right there. I just put my current point on it, and so that's that point right there. Okay, we're just about done. Now, I haven't done a, a super careful job of building my alignment here. Um, we've got lots of fill here. Let's just lower this down a little bit to make some more cut, see if we can balance it up. And that's my design. Okay, I think probably I've got too much, um, way too much fill here. So let's just lower the whole thing down a touch. And while I'm at it, reduce that grade. That's better. Okay. Now that didn't take me that long, but it's not a great design. We are moving fairly large amounts of material around, and uh, I can I can see that here. I can also see it in my um, here's here's all my grades, cut depth, 
uh, you can see I don't have any huge grades. Oh, there's a 14.5%. Where's that? That is right here. Oh, okay. So maybe I want to reduce that a little bit. Now it's 13%. Oh, but I made a bunch of cut. Okay, well, let's just lift the bottom up a little bit. That reduces it further to 12% and balances out the volumes a bit more. Okay. Right, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with my grades. Let's look at volumes. Uh, those are azimuths. No, oh, okay, I don't have a volume table. Now I could open a screen layout that has one in it, or I could just create a new data window. So I'm gonna do the latter. I'm gonna create a new data window and add some, some things to it. Now the data window is not just a table of numbers. Um, it's also a good way to export information to a spreadsheet. So I'm gonna view points every 100 meters. Okay, and I'm going to add in this table the station number and cut volume, fill volume. And while we're at it, let's just let's show the design totals. There it is. Move it over with the rest of my tables, and I can quickly switch between tables just by clicking on the data button. There's my volumes, and if I scroll down to the bottom, there's my totals. You can see the design is mostly balanced. We've got a little more cut than fill, and these are the volumes being cut and filled for eight, for each 100 meter interval. I can copy that to the clipboard and paste it into a spreadsheet. Now this is not a bad design. In fact, I'm going to save it. I'm calling it hand design because I want to I want to put in a um, a vertically optimized design in a minute, and I don't want to use up too much of our time, so I'm going to open an optimized design already. Now, just to note, the vertical optimization tool does cost extra, so um, this part of the software, there it is you would have to pay extra to, to use the, the tool. So I'll just show you the results quickly and uh, illustrate how it works. What you do for the vertical optimizer is you, first of all, define a horizontal alignment. Now we do have a horizontal optimizer too. I'm not gonna discuss that today, but it would, it would allow you to move these horizontal alignment points around and try and find the best design. Uh, I think my hand horizontal alignment here is a pretty good design and the horizontal optimizer isn't gonna find a much better one. But the vertical design that I made, uh, especially this one, is, is pretty poor and the optimizer can do a better job. So for vertical optimization, vertical optimization what you do is you, you specify um, how it's gonna design the alignment. In this case, I just chose uh, 10 meter points and it's just gonna build a polyline, so no, no curves, just 10 meter segments with maximum 2% grade break between them. That will effectively give me a K of five. Um, a 10 meter segment with a two meter grade break is the same as a curve with K equals five. And I put in maximum minimum grades. Those are constraints to the optimizer. I also put in some control points. It starts on a road, so I have a well-defined elevation. It finishes on a road, again, a well-defined elevation. And in the middle, um, there's a spot where it crosses that gully, and I don't want it to go below 460, but it's okay if it goes above. So I'm giving it a minimum elevation here, 460. And that's basically all I've done. I took the default costs, but it's using the cost of cutting and filling material to optimize the alignment. It's also using the cost of hauling material 
and um, that's what it tries to minimize. And I'm not going to run it because it does take a second. But here's the vertical alignment. And you can see that the mass hall diagram is just tracking the ground um, almost perfectly. And the maximum cut is around 800 um, cubic meters, not very much. Or the maximum accumulated fill. Sorry, it's not a, it's not a cut at all. Um, and there's the, the spot where I wanted to put that culvert. And as you can see, it's, it's above the 460 elevation. So it wasn't allowed to go down there. And it's got lots of little intersection points. These are 10 meter segments with maximum 2% uh, between and, and it forms a parabola naturally. Okay, so if you've got the optimizer, the vertical alignment process is a button push, go for coffee, come back, it's there. Sometimes it takes less than the time it takes to put the cream in your coffee. Um, this alignment is, is uh, three kilometers long, and it says here that the process time was one second. That's a little bit of a um, misleading number. The optimizer took one second, but the pre-process took about 20 seconds. Okay, so we've got a vertical alignment. Now, whether we did it by um, hand or with the optimizer, um, now it's time to go on to the next step. Let's put in some drainage. By the way, the cost for this alignment is 140000 And the design I created a second ago, let's just open it up just by eyeballing it. Called it demo something. There it is, demo hand design. That's the one. And if I open up our Explorer window here, it does give me the cost, but I need to uh, make sure that I calculate it. Turn on this little checkbox here. And this comes with the software, even if you don't have the optimizing option, the uh, costing option is built in, anybody can use it. And you can see here that my cost is, uh, for this design, the one that I, threw in by hand while you were watching is about $248,000. So not quite as cheap as the optimal one, which is 140. Right, next step, let's put in some uh, culverts. So I can do that here. I'm not gonna um, open the pre-existing one. I've got a little bit of a gully here. And if we look in the profile, I think we're, we're sitting right in the right spot. Yeah, there it is. Now, this is a natural channel. It, it looks like there's going to be a creek flowing there already. So I'm going to use our culvert editing tool here to add a culvert at this particular cross section. Now, I could change it to be maybe a little bigger because... Uh, the point that I selected is just a little to the left of the bottom of the of the gully edge. Okay, 1075, and it's a natural channel. There we go. Let's put the culvert in, and if we step over to that culvert, you can see it in the profile. So the default culvert that I set up some time ago and saved is attached to catch point, automatic uh, gradient, meaning match the gradient of the ground, and uh, a skew angle of 90, 90 degrees. Let's see what it looks like. So it's perpendicular. That's, that's not bad. Probably I want to skew it a little bit. And our cross section is not going to change. It's always a perpendicular cross section, but the culvert can be skewed. So let's try 120. I always pick the wrong direction. Yep. Okay, let's try 75. That's a little better. How about 70? So 90 is perpendicular to the road. And there we've skewed it a little bit. 
Right, now that's a, a natural channel. And one of the things we've been doing with version 10 is coming up with a um, catchment area calculation. So I'm just gonna flip over to version 10 and show you the catchment area for that point, which would give me an idea of how big that culvert should be uh, given knowledge of rainfall events. So this is a preview of our version 10 software. And what I did is I, I selected a point down here, that point there actually, and I ran this operation called um, drain modeling, tin operations, drainage area feature. And it generated this, this um, area here. And you can see it's 2.1 hectares and it stops. Well, you can guess where it stops. It stops on the ridge top, just like you'd expect. So my road originally came along the ridge top and then I had to deviate to deal with this steep section here. And that's given me this little catchment area of material of water running down 2.1 hectares. Uh, let's, let's do one, I'll just show you how it works. So um, I've got one over here already. Uh, let's, let's do another one. Um, now let's just, let's imagine that the road, um, yeah, let's just let's just go down here to the to the main creek gully. I'll pick a point there, any point, and run the catchment. Let's see what we got. So again, this is a preview of version ten. Um, so what we can imagine people wanting to um, look at where their road crosses an existing water course and figure out the catchment area. But also you could even do this for cross drain culverts. You know, if you've got a, a road on a side hill, um, there it is. So if we pick that point there, it's got this huge catchment area and whoops we're probably missing some in there and the area is uh, 110 hectares right back to the location module uh, let's add some cross drain culverts so we're along the ridge top here I don't need culverts um, but up here we're, we're going across the hillside so typically cross sections look like this and uh, we're going to have to get that uh, ditch across the road, get the water out. So why don't we put in a culvert, starting about here, put in a culvert every 100 meters all the way along there. So I'm, I'm gonna do that. So starting at 2110, I'm gonna put in a cross drain every 100 meters, and let's put in 10 of them. I, I think, I don't think it, uh, we'll put in more than the length of the road. And there they are. Okay, now why can't I see them on here? Oh, there they are. Yep, they're short. And they've put in, it's put in a natural skew because I've got um, each one of these is set up again with the, the default for cross drains, which you can save and it's available in the future. Uh, and I set up the default to attach to the upper ditch which is there, yeah, that makes sense. There's the upper ditch. And to go at a constant grade of 2% and always go downhill. Well, that makes sense. And also the skew is automatic. If I turn this off, I can type it in, but that gives you a little downhill skew so that the, the culvert has a, um, it kind of follows the dip of the road. Now we've got a bad culvert right here. If I click on it, you can see what, what's happening. It's basically, we shouldn't have put one here. And I'm in the right spot, it's selected. I'll just delete it. The rest look pretty good. One more thing, what about turnouts? This is a one lane road, it's only five meters wide. I wanna put in turnouts, so I should do some um, template modifications. 
So there's basically two ways to create a turnout. You can create a wide template, and then, and I would do that by copying this one and pasting it, and then changing some parameters, or in the assign by range dialog box here, this is where you would assign different templates to different station ranges. You can also override values. So I'm gonna put in a turnout uh, at 2800, and it's gonna be going uphill, so it should be on the right-hand side. Here's how I do it. I just pick the variable for the road width on the right-hand side of the road and change it from using the, the value that's defined in the template to using an override value. TO for turnout. Let's make it about, uh, well, I'm gonna make it 100 meters long. Now that actually didn't do anything yet. Here's how I make it do something. I'll give it a value. And if I wanna add another five meters to my road, I need to boost the width up to eight. Let's make it nine for good luck. And we wanna go a little bit beyond 28, let's say 2820, so we've got a 20 meter um, taper. And we'll do the same thing all the way up to 2880. So there's a, a fairly typical turnout. Use the default up to here, taper up to nine meters, stay at nine meters, taper back down to the default and then keep the default okay. That worked well, there it is. Um, of course, that's changed my volumes. And uh, I'm gonna put another one down here. That's around station 2385. Just select the one that I've already created, duplicate it, give it a new station. Start, center, or end, you pick, and it, it puts it in for you. Now this one's going downhill because it's also on the right hand side. So maybe that's balanced our volumes, not sure. We can take a quick look over here. If those if those were already in there before I did the um, optimization, then the optimizer would have taken care of it. And I can easily just jump in here and do the optimization again to readjust the, the vertical alignment. Right, well, let's let's assume that this is good. Let's look at the output. Um, I wanna generate some documents for defining the, uh, for construction purposes. And here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna use our multi-plot tool. Now the multi-plot allows you to build a piece of paper that contains plans, profiles, cross sections, and it takes a while to get it set up. Once you've got it set up nicely, you can save it as a book layout. It's a tiny file that goes on your hard drive. And here's an example. So there's a plan over profile, bunch of pages. Each plan has been rotated, so it goes from left to right. The profile does that automatically. So they kind of line up, not perfectly, because the plan is a bit bent. And uh, you do get this sort of thing sometimes where it, it doesn't work out exactly the way you want it. So you can adjust the position of the plan window um, using, I'm using the uh, shift arrow keys on my keyboard to adjust it and control arrow keys to rotate it there. So that one's been changed, but this one is still automatic. That one is still automatic. This one is, is manually adjusted by me and we're ready to print. Um, we've got a volume table in here. We've got a title block. You can put images in your title block. 
Um, there's stuff you can put underneath the profile window. I've got center line elevation, ground elevation. You can put other things down there if you want. Here's the section chapter. It looks like we've got more than we need. There's a lot of pages here. Let's just look at that. I'm using 10 meter intervals. Let's just change that. I'm going to change it to 20 meter intervals. So now I've got fewer pages and it's automatically paginating to show a cross section every 20 meters. There's text underneath the section window which can be customized. Um, and all of this stuff can be customized as well. In general, what you would do is you would open a book layout and then type a few things to change the, the uh, features that are not boilerplate, like uh, designer, uh, project name, things like that. Notice that the section window is set up to display all the culverts. Even if the culvert is not on a 20 meter interval, so there's another culvert there. And there are tables for displaying other things that you can add like um, curve tables, template assignments. So it's very flexible. And with the um, concept of, of chapters, you can build a document in one easy step and it, and it of course it prints. Um, but if you have Windows 10 or, or greater, um, 11's coming out now, you can use this Microsoft Print to PDF, so it will print to a PDF automatically. You don't need to buy the Adobe um, PDF Writer. You can also save as Land XML, and the Land XML options will produce, uh, let's just call this, demo three things the alignment itself with curves surface and you can choose which surface subgrade or any one of the surfaces or all of them in this design we've got um, subgrade surface and srf1 uh, we're not using srf2 and then it also produces cross sections, and those can be used to upload into uh, survey instruments for stakeout. And the surfaces can be used for machine um, machine control. And also, CAD programs will read Land XML, so it's a good way to move your data from our software into AutoCAD or Civil 3D or other um, CAD programs. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, if anybody else has a question, please, please feel free to send us an email. Um, or if you want, you can, you can leave a question on the YouTube page and, and we usually get around to answering those too. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day.